Hello, everybody. I'm Charles Venable, a uh, PhD scholar in um, American decorative arts, but my main love in that field is uh, American silver. And I happen to also be a consigner of about 100 lots to Heritage's upcomer, upcoming silver sale on November 16th. Um, and we're here today to talk about two objects from my collection that I am incredibly passionate about and ha frankly have spent absolutely <laughs> endless hours, usually late at nights, going through the internet, looking for images, trying to track down where the incredible engraver who worked on these two trays we're going to talk about got all of the images um, that he so um, artistically uh, engraved on these major trays. Um, to begin with, though, both of the trays are by the same maker, William Gale, one of them, the earliest one, and the smaller one we'll talk about last actually, is from 1848. Um, and we know this very specifically because William Gale was one of the very, very few American silver makers who actually put dates on his pieces of silver. They're little um, diamond shaped marks and they have dates in them. And that small tray obviously says 1848 and the large sort of monumental tray we'll start with first has a date for 1851 on the back of it. And we'll see in a minute that 1851 was kind of a cool year in American history um, in publishing and magically this tray was made in the same year. These two trays are from a very small group of trays. And as far as I can tell, I haven't seen any other work that I would say was definitely by him that was on a piece of silver by another American silversmith. So I'm guessing he could have even been an immigrant coming from Britain or from France. Um, who came to the United States, was in New York um, between at least 1848. And I know of another tray he did in a private collection from 1853. So that would make him in New York for about five years. But what a cool five years it was to be looking for print sources to be engraving on American silver. So let me back up a second and give you a bit of context about what was going on in the late 18th and the early 19th centuries that resulted in amazing things like these two extraordinary trays. Um, and one of them is that starting in the 18th, particularly the late 18th century and well into the 19th century, Western Europeans and Americans were fanning out all over the globe. They were starting to catalog all the flora and fauna, the plants and animals um, that grew all over the planet um, to give them names, to write them down, to make pictures of them, and to somehow uh, codify all this, these incredible things. They also were looking at the different types of people, different types of architecture, different types of religion, um, as they were traveling all over the globe collecting this information. And the goal was really to try to write what they found down in one place. Um, and so in the late 18th century, you start getting um, encyclopedias, more or less as we know them. And as you move into the 19th century, these books become more and more illustrated, which will eventually get us to these trays in a minute. Also, the ability to print books and to print magazines and to print literally art prints grew enormously. So the printing presses of the world just exploded by the mid 19th century. And what did that mean? That meant like normal people, the you and me's of the world, we could all of a sudden start getting magazines mailed to us. We could buy more books because they weren't as expensive. And so by the time we get to this engraver, and you can put Tommy, our producer is going to help me with the images. Uh, you can put up the big tray image now. Um, so he was working there at least from 1848 to 1853 in New York City, the biggest, biggest city in America. Lots of different people coming and going, things coming and going, books coming and going, art coming and going there. And you can see as he pans across this tray, it has animals on it, it has depictions of buildings. Um, in fact, let's go to the image of Mount Vernon, which I think will be over on the um, down in the bottom center in that circle, you've got your cursor on right there. And if you blow that up, on the one hand, you can see the fabulous scroll work, which is characteristic of the um, Rococo revival period of the 1830s, 40s, 50s um, in America. But most importantly, as we go through this great tray, you'll see all these images. So I wanted to start with architecture because if you saw this, you might not immediately see the view because most of the views of Monticello are from the river. 
I'm not Mars, Mount Vernon or from the river and you see the colonnade. This is an unusual view from the side, um, and, but it is, it is Mount Vernon. So this didn't take me too long to track down on one of my sleepless nights about where that image came from. It came from an 1836 painting by a guy named John Chapman. Um, and, and this is the aqua tint, which is a type of print that was made after his painting. And the engraver fudged a little bit here and there, um, changing the angle slightly, but almost certainly this is where he saw, he probably had a copy of the print or the shop had a copy of the print of Mount Vernon from 1839. And he reproduced it pretty accurately on, on that tray. Uh, to represent the founding father, George Washington, through his home, which was by the 1850s actually being saved um, um, by a group of women who saved Mount Vernon from destruction. Um, there's also an image of Monticello, which I believe is further down on the tray, near closer to the bottom. Oh, I'm sorry, over there on the right. There you go. And this you probably would recognize right off the bat. Um, but there are lots of images of Monticello out there, and it took me a while to find out where this one was actually published. And it turns out it was published on the front page of a magazine called Roar Repository, which was published in uh, upstate New York. And it would this one, the, the issue comes from is an 1842 issue, and it's very accurately uh, portrayed. Even the trees, like the, the tree in the foreground with the Y. Um, branching uh, structure, um, the little house off to the little building off to the left. Those are all engraved very, very well on, on the tray. And then the other piece of architecture I want to point out was a little harder to figure out. There's a castle um, on this tray straight right there. And so it's this kind of rambling looking castle with, you know, typical turrets um, and round towers. And I have looked at lots of silver that depicts little engravings of castles. And to be honest, most of them look pretty generic. And I just assumed the engravers sort of made them up for the most part. And this one might prove me and everybody else who thinks that wrong. Because after looking and looking and looking at, you know, Googling a castle, British castle, French castles, lo and behold, I was able to find, um, it was a painting first, but then it became an engraving in 1838. And there was an engraving of Conway Castle in Wales um, was published in a, um, a book called The Curiosities of Great Britain. And like I said, that came out in 1838, right in time um, for it to get to the United States and to be available for to be read, obviously, um, by people who bought the book, but also for engravers to be looking at sources of castles. And there you see um, a very close um, um, similarity to the castle. So this is a rare example that we've been able to actually identify um, one of these uh, castle-like structures on a piece of American silver. Interesting too um, um, is that there, there are some connections between Thomas Jefferson's and Jefferson and Wales and some of his, where his family came from, that's not so far from Conway Castle. So that is, that is kind of an interesting connection that may or may not um, have been known by the engraver, whoever ordered this tray in 1851, because they do have Jefferson's home and then they have Conway Castle. But one of the things that took far more time and in, in some ways proved to be more interesting is where in the world did the engraver get all of the images of domestic but also exotic animals that literally came from lived all over the globe um, and like i said it, it turns out that this thirst for knowledge of cataloging all the plants and all the animals um, are, are play out here very very well because um, some of the earliest printed uh, versions of these types of animals we're looking at, and there you're looking at a lynx on the right and a lion there up on the left. They're sort of facing off um, on, on this particular tray. Um, begins to be put together by a British scientist. There's an, a beaver um, there in, in the middle um, named Oliver Goldsmith, and he was British. Um, and he wrote something after years and years of work called a history of the earth and animated nature. And that would have meant living nature. 
Um, and the first volumes uh, come out in 1774, and eventually there are eight volumes. There's actually my set. I never got the complete ones, but the ones that have illustrations that relate to this tray are included in the seven volumes that will actually be sold with this lot, um, with, the, with the tray, so that whoever buys it will have access to it. So what we're looking at right there, uh, if you'd go there's a beaver, but if you went back, you'd have an even more exact match to that one right there. And if you can blow that up a bit, this is an engraving out of one of those early 18th century volumes showing the links. And that's exactly the one that is on the tray. The graver just, as they often do, you know, they, they, they're engraving this um, but he flipped it around when he engraved it so it faces the other other direction. So there's the links with those very pointy ears right uh, right there. So over time, this book by Goldsmith that had animals um, depicted in it became a top seller and went through literally scores and scores and scores of editions and reprintings. And as time went on, as I mentioned, it got easier to print and eventually even print in color. And so the editions of this book from the 1840s and 50s, which includes an edition that was printed in New York and one that was printed in Philadelphia, um, which would have made it even easier for Engraver and William Gale to have a copy of all these volumes and flip through the plates in them. Um, they include dozens and dozens and dozens of animals from all over the world. Um, and so, uh, Tommy, if you can go down and look at the picture um, that will be near those volumes of uh, the plate that has all the deer on it right there uh, at the top in the top row, that one. Um, and so if we can blow that up and scroll down to the bottom. Um, so this is, they were, again, they were cataloging things. So these are all the um, mammals that are in the goat family, the sheep family, the deer family that they start putting on um, plates together. And right there at the top of that little mountain, um, that you're looking at. There is a there is a sheep. Um, I think when you read the book, it's called a Syrian. The other one with the very long ears, that's called a Syrian sheep. And then there's the other little um, ram that has the curly horns. Um, both of those appear on this particular um, tray. So it's just showing you as they do on the smaller tray that we will um, get to in just a second. So to conclude here, um, let's go to um, the image of the crouching leopard in the tree, which if I remember correctly, is at the top left of that tray, Tommy. There you go. And he's right there and you, you can blow up where, exactly where you are and see that um, leopard snarling, um, sort of ch up a tree, probably has been chased by hunters or dogs and he's literally treed and looking through these forked branches as if he's gonna attack you. And it was so dynamic, I just couldn't, imagine where this engraver saw that image. And it turns out after looking and looking and looking and looking, um, I was able to track down that that image was the cover image to a magazine called Penny Magazine, the Penny Magazine that's published in London. And this was in an issue from 1833. And it was a story about somebody who had gone off to India who, um, had seen a leopard and they had an engraver for the, for the magazine um, produce the, this particular image, which again is reversed um, on, on the tray um, as is pretty typical in engraving. And so it, you, this just shows that magazines, prints, paintings were used by engravers and silversmith studios um, in the United States, but they, this material was coming in from all over the world. So you could depict literally the whole world of animals um, if you wanted to. Now, now let's go to the small tray, um, which isn't tiny. Um, it, it, it is the, you can, you can look at the lot and, and see the um, dimensions here. The big one is really monumental, incredibly heavy thing. This is more of a small tray, probably made to hold glasses when you would have um, you bring them out to serve them to your guests. They might have glasses uh, of port or wine uh, on a tray like this. It's also different in that it has cut corners. Uh, it has these canted corners, which is a very nice, elegant touch, but it doesn't have the fancy handles on the big tray. But there's a great example if you just keep zooming in um, right there on that guy with the curly horns. We just saw him on one of those plates from Goldsmith's um, 
book from the 1770s. I'll move over, if you will, a bit to the center. And you see this guy right here. Um, he is, um, and so being trained in an art historian, you, you, you study gods and goddesses from various cultures. And you also learn um, through your studies, that there are certain formats for certain types of God. So if you're trying to depict um, like if, if you ever get to go to Rome, lucky enough to do that, you would see and, and you are looking at some of the big fountains in the squares there. You almost always will see the image of this guy who is the god of the river. Usually he's leaning on a vessel, as you see here on the left side, that water's gushing out of just like a river. And also he's often holding in his other hand what is the rudder to a boat. Um, and you see that engraved here, again, it's reversed. Um, and the other liberty that the engraver in New York took when he was looking at the pattern book is that for whatever reason, he, he, wanted, the, he wanted the river god to face our friend the goat over there um, on, the, on the right. He didn't want his head turned around backwards the way it is in the original, is, is the original book. So it, it turns out that the book that this river god image comes from is an incredibly rare little thing. Um, it's the size, it, it's a size of publication that um, almost would fit in your pocket. So an engraver could carry it to work with them or you could, um, the owner of the shop might have it and loan it to the engraver. Um, and this is a very specific book that was created for engravers to basically be able to look up gods in them and then copy them onto the silver um, or whatever else they're working on. It was first published in 1811 um, by a guy named Guillaume Lamame. Um, and then the second edition, which is the one that I finally tracked down at a rare book dealer um, in France, is the one that will be sold with this lot so that whoever buys this tray will have the, uh, in this case, the 1821 book that must have been in the hands of the engraver in New York in um, 1848. Uh, 20 years, some odd years later. And this is the this is the frontispiece from the book, very elaborate. You know, it's about engraving. So why wouldn't you have somebody make an elaborately engraved uh, frontispiece? And right there you see in French that this is, um, if you scroll up a little bit, it's about myth the mythology um, and a stomp that's like for printing. And so these are the images of mythological gods um, that you would use in printing engraving, or in this case, in silver engraving. And um, you can then, you can also see the um, rest of the um, frontispiece here. And, and, and below uh, that little wreath of ornament, I think it says second printing Paris, um, uh, may not be here, but it's uh, this is the 1821 edition by Blanchard. So whoever buys this is going to get a very rare book. I think there are like three copies in libraries in the United States. One's at the Morgan Library uh, in New York, for example, but very, very few institutions or private collectors would have that. But um, I have enjoyed these two objects. They're absolute masterpieces in my mind. There's an, one's even smaller tray, a circle, circular one at the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, which is the one I know of in a public institution. But frankly, I'm um, sorry to tell you, Chicago, it does not come close to the quality of these two or another larger tray that's in a private collection um, in Kentucky, um, where I once was the director of the Art Museum um, in Louisville. Thank you very much for joining me today. Uh, it's been a really pleasure chatting with you about these two extraordinary masterpieces of American silver. Um, also, Karen, uh, the specialist, Karen Rigdon, the specialist who's handling this sale, she asked me to, to make a few comments on each of the lots as to why um, a silver scholar or a silver collector like me would have bought these things. And so I had a great, a lot of fun being able to put down those um, things, which are quoted in each of the catalog lots. So you can, you can Google my name, Charles Venable, and I'm sure they will show right up. So enjoy searching. Hope you don't have to stay up all night long the way I did for months, trying to track down all the animals on the strays, um, but enjoy yourself. They're really great things. Thank you so much.